Good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, being here on this snowy day. Uh, I was fortunate enough to go to this Heed Foundation resident retreat back in October, and uh, the director of it, uh, Stuart Fine, asked that we come back and do a little presentation to everybody. And so uh, this is in fulfillment of that request. Uh, just real quick, Thomas Heed, you might have heard of the Heed Ophthalmic Foundation. He made his fortune in the railroad business, uh, and he suffered uh, from an iritis, and his wife also suffered from a, a retinal detachment. So he developed this relationship with the ophthalmic, you know, uh, uh, industry at that time. Was he was in Chicago, and he approached the uh, Northwestern chair, and he said, "I wanted to make I want to make a donation," and he left a large portion of his estate to the you know to to that trust. And uh, since then, they've been funding mostly fellows as a HEED fellow. And we have several fellows on our faculty here. And, uh, you know, they've funded over 1,000 fellows since they started. And then they also have this yearly meeting, uh, this resident retreat. And they, they take, you know, like 20 residents or so from across the country. And they bring 20 faculty in. And they, they split the faculty. They have maybe 10 senior faculty, which are mostly chairs from you know, different departments, and then they have young academic faculty that have just started into the academic, uh, and, and really the, the purpose is just to talk about academic career in ophthalmology and, and kind of demystify some of the process and, and motivate us to, to go into academic, uh, you know, careers. It, you know, it's a two-day meeting. Um, they just cover the basic facts, and, and the, the younger faculty all get up and spend 15 to 20 minutes talking about how they decided to do what they're doing and, and uh, you know, some of the difficulties they've encountered. And, and we also spend a fair amount of time on, on grant writing, and, and uh, some of the folks from the NEI were there to talk about the different types of grants and some tips on doing that. So I had a hard time figuring out what to talk about because, you know, we talked about everything. And... Uh, and there was so much information presented, so I thought what I would do is just uh, maybe throw up some quotes that to me were influential and I thought, in, in, you know, uh, insightful, and then maybe get your input on, because, you know, we have great faculty here that have all gone into academic careers, and we have some folks here that are in private practice, and you know, this came up a little bit, but not much, because the assumption was most of the residents there were, were you know, planning on going into academic careers. That's how we got selected to, to be there. But I thought uh, Natalie Kerr is uh, one of the younger faculty members, and she said, just be honest with yourself when you're deciding whether to go into academics or private practice. And, and uh, you know, you don't want to do something unless you're really sold on it, and uh, you just need to really just be honest with yourself on what's going to make you happy. Um, we talked a little bit about whether you should do a fellowship, and uh, n not everybody there had done fellowships, and it wasn't necessarily, you know, something that you had to do to stay in academia. You, you should do it because you want to do it, not because you think you need to do it. And, uh, you know, we didn't spend a lot of time on these, but I thought for us, you know, here, this might be something worth thinking about um, if we want to discuss it. I guess we can just, I'll f run through these slides, and then if you guys have any, I'd like to hear comments from the faculty on you know, on any, any topic that we cover. So they, they said really an academic career is composed of four components, or it can be composed of four components, uh, you know, patient care, teaching, research, either clinical or basic, and then service opportunities and academic responsibilities, such as sitting on the IRB or, you know, having, you know, travel abroad to, to different countries and, uh, you know, traveling to speak and such. And, and and they, they emphasize that you could probably just pick two of these that you're most passionate about and focus on them. Um, and Dr. Fine you know, th said, spend time doing what's important to you. That's what's going to make you the most happy. <coughs> we talked a lot about finding the right place to go work. And uh, these were the things that I thought were really insightful. You want to pick a place that has a sufficient volume of patients that you're going to be able to to you know, see a lot. Location is obviously one of the most important factors when you're finding a place to, to work. Uh, you need to like the culture of the department. Uh, they all emphasize that the chairman's direction and, and his outlook is very important. 
you want to look at the funding available, if you want to do you know, research, whether they have endowments, NIH, how much NIH funding, and whether the, if you don't get funded or if you miss a grant cycle, that if, you, if they're willing to bridge your research uh, and if they have enough depth to their department to bridge you. Sometimes there might, they might not be advertised. This was interesting to me. Sometimes a, a, an academic department might not be advertising a job, but if that's where you really want to be, you, you know, you talk to them about it. They may create the position for you. Um, Dr. Cass is the chair at WashU. So th uh, things that they said would, would help you thrive in an academic environment. You know, there's this, there are a couple things. Being passionate is key. You know, being passionate about what you do and, and your work, uh, because it takes a lot of extra work that oftentimes you're not remunerated for. Uh, money cannot be the most important thing to you in an academic world. Uh, I thought that was a good point. It, you know, it still may be a motivating factor, but it probably can't be the most important thing to you. Uh, Dr. O'Brien said one thing to help you thrive in an academic environment is trying to say yes, even if at the time you might not see the what's in it for me aspect of it. And, but and she followed that with, you have to be careful about overextending yourself, you know, because you're going to be approached to do a lot more things than you have time to do. Um, but, you know, try and say yes to, to people when they, Pollock, they're so funny, be where you are, he said. Uh, Tony Aldavi said, have a saint for a spouse. Uh, <laughs> and Jennifer, this was an interesting, uh, she said one time she was making a cake for her kids and you know, you get the, you're putting the icing on the cake and the, some of the cake gets mixed in with the icing and just looks terrible. But, she, you know, she's like, I could have thrown the cake away and maybe started over, but she said, you know, when it's good enough, it's good enough and you're just done with it. And she said that's sometimes true with grant writing, with, uh, with many different aspects of a career, that it's never going to be perfect, but when it's good enough, it's good enough. And uh, Stephen McLeod's uh, one quote, he said, the the bottom line for getting promoted is demonstrated excellence. Is really performing in your job and setting a track record for yourself. Uh, just quickly on grant funding, <laughs> Dr. Fain, if you don't submit it, you're not going to get funded. Uh, I thought this was interesting. The first time, you know, if you're a PI with the first time grant proposal, uh, Lauren McNichols, who is uh, at the NEI, uh, said they have a, approximately an 80% funding rate, and everybody's like, no way, but I guess it's true. That's what she's saying. A K08 is a good way to get started as a clinician scientist, and the uh, the um, salary for the K08 is, you know, m for ophthalmology anyway. They figured out a way to to get the NIH to fund you up to uh, a, a competitive salary, um, and they'll protect 75% of your time for research, and uh, first time awards are 70 to 100% fund rate. So. Um, and you can't take rejection f from a grant personally. I don't know if uh, Paul's in here, but uh, he has experience with, with, you know, the first time you might get turned down, but you have to keep trying and, and submit it again and again. And that's it. That's all I had. So, um, you know, any comments from the faculty? I'd be interested to hear, you know, wh why you chose to stay in academics, some of the most uh, challenging things for being in an academic career, and Maybe from, you know, even the private guys in here, you know, why you decided to go to a private practice and, uh, you know, anyway. Dr. Fisher. I just want to address the fellowship. <coughs> the key to doing the fellowship is doing a good fellowship because there are, there are some really bad fellowships where you don't get to do much. Um, and that's what I've heard from the faculty. I think I encourage everyone to just keep an open mind. Um, all the years I was on the residency selection committee, I was just stunned by the, the misperception that resident applicants had, even after going through residency, as to what exactly academic medicine is. And you get the offhand comments, well, you know, I don't think I'm going to you know, sit down and do research all the time. And there's a lot of misconceptions as to what academic ophthalmology entails. And it's not one thing. It's four things, as you mentioned. And, and you don't have to do all of them. 
Mm -hmm. It's true. That was a big uh, emphasis from everybody is it, the things have changed to, to allow that flexibility. Anyone else have any comments or Dr. Cree? mentioned the importance of uh, the institutional culture. Mm -hmm. And it's just so important. I think I think it's just so easy as, as we make our decisions for ourselves in life to kind of be starry-eyed, you know, as we look at the big names or the icons or the institutions that have been around a long time. And, you know, we need to be real aware. I, I think that really most of us will be happiest in a culture where people are good, decent human beings. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I disagree with this slide. I know that everybody had a problem with it there too. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. So I think Paul wanted to go last for some reason.